Well, thank you everyone for uh, joining us uh, today to uh, talk about uh, you know team building and uh, bringing on new teammates and so forth. Um, I'm happy to, to be a part of the Hartford Startup Week. Um, it's been a, a great experience seeing how Hartford has come and, and built up over the past 10 years. Uh, and, and this whole event is uh, a part of it. Uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Eric Francis. I'm a senior engagement manager at Techstars and also the CEO of Trifecta Ecosystems. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Connecticut. I went to CCSU in New Britain, uh, went through Reset's Accelerator program about five, six years ago uh, and, and seen a lot of the great work, uh, everybody that's been involved in this week and a lot of the speakers uh, do over the past uh, you know, five, 10 years. Uh, so it's an honor to, to be here, uh, and I appreciate um, you know, these uh, fine gentlemen uh, agreeing to be a part of this uh, session. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go around, uh, have everybody introduce themselves, uh, and kind of talk a little bit about their uh, where they are, kind of uh, what perspective they have, and then we'll just hop right into it. Um, so uh, Greg, I'm actually going to start with you, if you want to uh, kick it off. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, my name's Gregory Lewis. Greg, feel free to call me that. I'm with the Connecticut Small Business Development Center. I have an office in the University of Connecticut School of Business, so I'm right across the street from Gamble Pavilion. Um, prior to, I've been, let's see, I've been a business advisor with the SBDC now for about seven years. Prior to that, I worked for about nine years with the Community Economic Development Fund. I was, uh, they're, they're a lender for small business, as a matter of fact, and I was a business advisor there as well. So I got about, 16, 17 years doing this. I've also had my own business in the past and I've run large statewide training organizations uh, in Texas, Massachusetts, and even in Connecticut. At one point I ran a summer science program for high school students at, uh, at Brandeis University. So I've got a significant amount of administrative experience and working with entrepreneurs. So uh, I, I try to, to bring that to bear to help, to help my clients and uh, just with the SBDC, I've lost track of how many, but I've probably had four or 500 clients over the seven years I've been there. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to chatting with everyone. Well, thank you very much and uh, we're glad to have you. Uh, Miguel, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for having me. Very excited to be here with all of you. I uh, hope everyone is staying safe and, and healthy during these times. Uh, my name is Miguel Polito. I'm uh, with Dell Technologies. I have the very fortunate pleasure and honor of leading a team of engineers for Dell's OEM solution team, where we look at helping amazing companies, uh, both startups uh, in startup mode and household names reach uh, the full potential of their unique ideas. Over the years, uh, I've been grateful to be given the chance to lead several teams through times of celebration and, and times of reflection, uh, nurturing the growth mindset uh, for continuous improvement, which is something I feel strongly about. Uh, during uh, COVID-19, uh, obviously has contributed uh, to some of this reflection, but I'm extremely motivated by the bright minds that I get to uh, work with. Uh, super fortunate to work with these bright minds, uh, working on amazing solutions uh, like in the space of telemedicine, industrial automation, telecommunication, touchless devices and applications that maybe many of you are seeing today as well, and all the innovation around artificial intelligence applications. So looking forward to this discussion today, and thanks for having me. Well, thank you. We're, we're glad to have you. And uh, Antoine, you uh, round it out. How's it going? My name's Antoine Debnam. Um, initially, I'm an inventor by trade and turned an invention into a company. Um, I've worked with various people, most teams um, in a form of mentoring. Um, now I'm building my own team for another initiative that I'm pushing out called Worldwide Voices. And my dynamics from advising teams to being on teams to now starting my own, give me a little bit of insight of how things work for startups. Very cool, thank you. So to kind of kick it off, I'm gonna kind of take the approach that I actually uh, saw on LinkedIn, they were talking about it. I saw a thread uh, about um, how a lot of managers, you know, some managers right now are reaching out to their employees or through this time, like 2020 has been difficult, right? We all have been through some sort of transition, some things, some things happened. We've all had, um, again, I don't have to explain myself, but some, sometimes I feel like we do. Um, but it's one of those things where as a team, you have to kind of check in. So I just kind of want to kind of, uh, we're not necessarily a team, but on this panel, we are. So Antoine, how has 2020 been for you? How, uh, how have you been uh, getting along? Um, 2020 has been 
topsy turvy. It's been a roller coaster. Um, tons of introspection, tons of taking it back to basics, keeping it simple. Um, tons of empathy and sympathy for people out there, friends of mine who've caught COVID, um, one passed. So just managing emotions during this time, but understanding that um, things will get better, we'll get through it for sure. And same thing in business, just keeping the business low, running on very efficient, basic skills, nothing elaborate, trying to get the fundamentals down because I don't know financially if the financial COVID is over. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. Greg, how uh, how is, uh, have you been uh, handling uh, this year? Well, as you can imagine, with being with the SBDC, we are partially funded by the SBA, the Small Business Administration. So we had a responsibility to help companies um, negotiate idle loans and PPP. Idle is economic injury disaster loans and the PPP is a HIV protection program. So we had to explain that to literally to thousands of small business owners. Uh, and it's been extremely stressful. Uh, so we'd help them with their applications. We'd help them um, assess whether or not they were even eligible. And now, as you can imagine, particularly with PPP, we're trying to help those same companies figure out how to ensure that they get loan forgiveness. So those, those PPP loans, in fact, turn into grants. So it's been extremely stressful. Um, unfortunately, I'm hearing from some of my clients who are saying that there's just no way they can continue. Others have had opportunities to expand their businesses beyond, in some cases, beyond their wildest dreams. That actually happens. So this has been a very mixed bag for most people, but the preponderance of the folks we work with have definitely seen a downturn. So it's been, it's been difficult. Mm -hmm. And I, well, one I want to say is that thank you for the work that you've been doing, because I know I was on some of those webinars uh, about the PP uh, and the uh, payroll protection plan with CI and CT next and so forth. Uh, and so I, you know, like there's uh, people like you kind of helped out the businesses uh, that needed it and kind of uh, expressing that time. And you are definitely right. It's, uh, it's not over. And there's a lot of uh, businesses that are still struggling. So uh, appreciate that insight. Uh, Miguel, so I guess uh, I guess I'm gonna kind of bleed uh, my question for you, and also into one that I, I was wondering is that, like, how has this transition been with you? I mean, I know you're fully remote anyways. I know that you've kind of been on this kind of remote uh, kind of management of teams anyway. So, like, how how has the uh, uh, 2020 been? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll echo some of the sentiments I've heard already. Def definitely a, a roller coaster ride, uh, especially with uh, some of our customers' businesses. Uh, we're seeing a lot of a lot of uh, folks pivot pivot their ideas and taking advantage of next generation technology trends uh, to try to get ahead of you know get ahead of COVID essentially right N nobody is is really kind of COVID proof uh, but but people are trying and that's that's part of what's you know what I mentioned is is motivating me uh, tremendously but but in, in large part uh, most of my team as you, as you mentioned has been remote with with a few traditionally going into the office for proof of concept testing or, or meetings and other related office tasks that might might occur. But by and large, we, we've been very successful, I'd say, in extending um, in-office activities remotely, using virtualized sandboxes for, for each team member and, and even our customers to, to test and qualify solutions. Um, I think uh, the effectiveness uh, of working remotely is, is pretty well documented, I would say, from a productivity perspective. But I'm always very cognizant on the other hand, and, or on one hand, I should say, of, of staying connected with the team and, and, and on the other hand, sort of balancing the time each team member um, needs for themselves, right? Undoubtedly, there's been an increase in meetings that we're able to have just, just because there's a, a calendar slot in open in Outlook, right? Um, th this, uh, as many of you probably know, could, could be a challenge, right? If, if you're uh, not careful, you you have you know five to ten back to back Zoom meetings, right? That's so I, I typically try to encourage you know building in time to recharge the battery. You know it's it's a marathon, obviously not a race. We hear that pretty pretty regularly, um, and for many of us, we're we're spending an increased amount of time uh, behind screens or at our desks. So creating a schedule that sort of builds in that that activity away from your desk. Or, or moves, you know, some of these Zoom calls to, to maybe a phone call that you're having, you know, in your backyard or, or somewhere where you can get, you know, a view of the sky, if you will. 
Um, and all of this, I think, is pretty helpful, and, and I, I try to encourage that. Um, you know, we don't we don't want to uh, fall into the the all too familiar Zoom fatigue that we can we keep hearing about uh, these days. So. Yeah, I think uh, phone calls are going to come back now. Uh, they they went away for a while because people are texting and emailing yeah. and all this kind of stuff. And now everybody's like, "Listen, just get me on a phone. Like, let's just yeah. have a fifteen minute conversation. Absolutely. Let me take a walk and let let's get on it." You know, the walk and talks are uh, are back in vogue. I don't, yes. I don't know necessarily they went away, but they're uh, they're definitely around right now. Um, Cool. Thank you. Um, so, so I know we have a different variety of kind of experiences, different uh, stages of where you, where all three of you are at, and so forth. So, Greg, I'm gonna kind of start with you in terms of uh, advice. So, have you changed the way you give advice? Uh, you know, this year uh, in terms of how people are building teams or how they're going about working with their teams. Um, I know it's uh, one of the big things for a lot of small businesses right now is um, who do I, you know, at the beginning of the year, who do I keep and who do I not keep um, and, and so forth. And so I guess is, uh, has your advice changed, uh, you know, this year? I don't think, I don't think I could say it's changed so much. Um, a lot of the basics still apply. If you're going to build a team, there's certain, there are things you need. There are people, there are people you need and skills you have to have if you're going to have a successful business. Um, I think, well, as Miguel said, he's working with companies that are pivoting. If you expect or if you're even forced to have to pivot, if you, you know, you've been working on something for two or three years and then COVID, well, I can, I, actually, I have an example. I've uh, been working with a company that had an expectation of working with the airline industry. Well, that's pretty much even the, I think recently, it was a couple of days ago, I was reading that the uh, CEO of United Airlines said that he doesn't expect their industry to come back to anything approximating normal until 2024. So that means that company I've been working with needs to make a significant pivot. So the skill set that they probably need as they make that assessment of what do we do next, the skill set's likely to change. So you have to learn to be flexible. But if you're an entrepreneur, I don't care if you're a startup or, or you've been at it for 10 years, you, are, you should know that. You should know that um, your work is never done. You may need to rethink your whole, your whole notion of how your business will operate just based on circumstances. And these, these current circumstances have made that clear. So that's what I would have to say in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, it. You know, when it comes down to like um, pivot moments or moments where, you know, a lot of things are happening, sometimes just the basics, right? You know, just going back to the basics is, is what you need to do. Um, and, and I think that's uh, what I've seen a lot of the advisors do is kind of just go back to what are the business basics? Okay, who's your customer? How are you making money? Did, did your customer get affected? Because there's a lot of those two or three kind of step processes where um, you may not be starting to get affected until now. Right or a little bit later, um, and and you know some of them get, some people got affected right away. Um, so a Antoine, it seems like you, you know you've gone through a shift a little bit uh, in uh, in the past year or so in the terms of being a solopreneur, and you know as as a lot of us have have probably done who's been watching this is like you know done it all ourselves, want, worn all the many hats. What have you learned from going like from a solo entrepreneur to working within a team and leading a team? Well. Um... There's more upside to having a team. <laughs> and I know that when you're an entrepreneur and you're starting out, you have the direction. You don't want disagreement too much with that direction or idea. Um, you have all the equity because you got to do all the work. You don't want to give up too much of your company in equity. But I do believe in um, a person should try as much as they can on their own, not to stress out or not to burn out, but to fill themselves out because a lot of entrepreneurs start out with theory and you really got to put that theory to the road before you can even build a team around it. And um, even little exercises I would do out of practicality is if I would say, if I want to move a million dollars worth of X, right? X units, like of this product that I invented, what does that look like per month, per week, per year, per day in sales and movement? Because um, through social media glamour, we can easily just say it's a round number, like a million dollars. What does that look like? And then as you start moving toward it, you start to see what it feels like to actually just try to sell 10 units or just try to sell 20 units. 
when you build a team around yourself, they're going to want to see that you've done that type of competence work, that you really know how to hit a sales target because they're working with you, whether on an equity or whether you're, especially if you're paying them, they want to know that you can deliver. And um, so from a solopreneur, I can just take these experiments by myself. But as a team builder, luckily I have that experience behind me and I go very cautiously and I communicate heavily with my team about where we are, where we're trying to go. And I acknowledge all the obstacles we're facing, get their input. And we slowly begin to work together to get a rhythm together. And then that brings in more revenue. And that's, that's why a team is better because we did bring in more revenue as a team, but we had to give ourselves that time to come mesh together. And that would have been more difficult if I hadn't already took a lot of bumps and bruises on my own first. So what I kind of heard you say was that self-awareness is actually really key for an entrepreneur, right? Like you went through the process, you, you said, you know, I can do this, I can do that. And then you realize, well, maybe I'm not as good as hiring somebody who could, to do that, right? My time isn't as, as efficient if I'm focusing on everything versus just a few things, right? And so I think that that's definitely an interesting kind of observation because for a lot of young entrepreneurs, right? You know, they have to have the self-awareness to even build the right team, to really understand their strengths and their weaknesses and being able to kind of bring people in that complement that. Um, I mm -hmm. think, I don't know, I don't know, uh, uh, Greg, if you can kind of comment on this, but is there a difference between maybe how uh, kind of a little bit older um, executives or people coming out of industry, uh, you know, the 40, 50 year old coming and building a business versus the first time uh, entrepreneur? Like, is there a difference between how they, uh, you know, like them being self-aware or different stages in their, um, uh, their, their career, do they tend to build business or teams a little bit differently? Do they have the same problems? Huh. I've never actually looked at that, but that's an interesting question. I, what I, let me say this about that. Um, oops, you're back to basics. A lot of the same things always apply, but I think with, um, Millennial, with millennials and Gen Zers, I think they're more used to, uh, so, well, certainly they're more used to social media. They're more used to interacting with one another virtually, that sort of thing. Uh, I, I, in some respects, I think they're more accustomed to what it takes to build a team. I think they're, that's just part of who they are. It's just what they've always done. Uh, if you're my age, <laughs> Um, it was pretty, I, when I first, I, the first time I started a business, I assumed I'd, I'd go it alone because that's what I always envisioned, you know, that the American entrepreneur is um, like the kind of person you read about in a Ayn Rand. You just, you know, you build it all by yourself and, you know, you have a huge success and it's, it's all due to what you've done. And it's never like that. It wasn't, it wasn't like that when Ayn Rand wrote her books and I don't want to start a political argument, but it's just not like that. You have to have a team, a community around your ideas just to help them uh, reach fruition. Um, let me just, a little bit of an aside. When we first started, when the, the SBDC was first reconstituted, we went through some training. One of the training modules we went through was regarding a company called BOSI, BOSI DNA. That's spelled B-O-S-I and DNA is in deoxyribonucleic acid DNA. And it talks about entrepreneurial DNA. And everybody's isn't the same. Um, and I think that they, they come up with the, they came up with a grid that has four quadrants. And they talk about builders, uh, specialists, innovators. And the fourth one, I can't remember what the O stands for, but it's more or less the kind of person who brings in the money, <laughs> uh, the rainmakers. And you need at least one person from each of those four quadrants in order to have a successful business. So when, you're, when you start thinking about a team, let's say again, let's look at Gen Zers. Like my son is a Gen Zer. And I've had actually the, the couple of the most successful businesses I've worked with started out as student startups at UConn. And they, again, this was natural for them to build. It, it was very natural to build a team and to, to look at what they, they lacked in terms of skill sets. And typically that's oftentimes marketing and finance. Um, it, lots of engineers, but if you're if you have a team of only engineers, you're probably headed for trouble. If you don't find those people who are good at sales, who are good at marketing, who understand the finances and can make sure that you're making money, I can tell you there's so many stories of even large companies 
that in some cases were billion dollar companies that really didn't have a clear picture of how they made money. I know that's hard to believe, but it happens. So I don't care if you're in your, in your 50s or your 20s, a lot of the same stuff applies. You've got to, you've got to fill those gaps because you can't do all four of those things. It's unlikely that you have a skill set that's that broad ranging. And if you do, it's probably fairly shallow. And at some point you're gonna need more in-depth knowledge and background. So just, you need to be, as an entrepreneur, you need to be conscious of that. And don't be shy about acknowledging that you've got weaknesses. That's a, that, that's a valid point. Again, self-awareness, you have to understand your strengths and weaknesses uh, and kind of lean into, lean into them, right? Um, you know, you, everybody's not going to be, we, I, mean, I mean, as entrepreneurs, we all think we can do it all, right? We want to be Superman. We want to be able to save the day. We're, you know, fixing problems, um, but it's not the case. Uh, qu qu quick question. What was the name of that grid again that, that you just mentioned? It's, it's BOSI DNA. I just looked it up online. Okay. B-O-S-I-D-N-A. They have a, if you go to their website, I think they just walk you through their, um, their assessment tool, which tells you where, what your entrepreneurial DNA is. Uh, I was trying to get more information, more general information about the company, but wasn't having much luck. But anyway, again, we went through that training and it was very useful. Just a quick aside, it turns out we had exactly one rainmaker, one innovator, one builder, and everybody else on our team was a specialist. <laughs> so... Hey, look, at least you know, we again, the, the, one, one of each of the others. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, uh, so everybody, I do see that you're putting in questions in the chat. Um, please keep them coming. We will get to them in a minute. Um, I'm going to continue like the, a little bit of the thread of the, uh, thought that we have going here. Cause I think it, 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 um, it, it has a lot of value to it. So Miguel, I kind of want to talk about, again, you're, you're, you're at Dell, you're managing a big team. I'd love to understand like how big of a team you are, you're, you're managing and so forth. And, uh, you know, for you, you are both leading a team, but also part of a team, right? You're, you're, you're in both positions. Um, so I guess, uh, can I talk, talk a little bit about like self-awareness of your team, right? Understanding like, how do you, you know, pick and choose, uh, people coming into them? Like, again, within a unit, within a, a big business, um, how, how do you kind of go about assessing the, the, you know, who, who your team is. Um, and I guess I would love to understand maybe about like the structure a little bit, because I've heard about these pods that, you know, bigger corporations doing these pods and having smaller groups, uh, part of a bigger pod. So um, can you just give a little structure of kind of how your team's uh, situated? Sure, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, typically, uh, so my, my team is, is about 30 to 35 people. Um, so, so not extensively large, uh, not small, uh, but uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, sort of knowing knowing what each individual on your team's role is and, and where their strengths and, and weaknesses are, are is very important. I, um, I was, was pretty fortunate, I think, to um, always just have um, a, a general posture of, uh, of sort of letting leadership principles, le leadership characteristics guide, guide my path forward. Um, even as an individual contributor, I, I've always been of the notion that um, you know, if you if if you're a leader, you're going to lead re whether a a small company or a large company is giving you a title of a leadership. Um, we all lead every day, and it's it's a it's a way of life, really. Um, it's something that you do in in your uh, you know for your family when you're out in public or when you're at a household or or whatever that may be. Um, so I've generally characterized sort of the the qualities of a of a dream team, if you will, um, into into a couple of pieces. Um, having having great leadership is is one of them. Great people, um, a shared passion that that's generally glued together by a solid mission statement of what your team's charter is going to be, uh, and then and then setting them up for success. So having a winning team, right? So uh, when I when I talk about leadership qualities, you know, I I also mean being able to um, identify whether there's somebody that's a pro in role, right? Somebody that doesn't necessarily want to go out and be a leader, but they're they're perfectly happy. Uh, being an individual contributor and and they're um, they're they're reaching their stride there they're doing wonderful things and and they need to maintain that piece but but overall I I think we as as a leader you need to be able to care about your people and trust your people right there's there's a a tactical piece of of the daily business that you have to run um, but there's also the strategic piece of it that you have to be looking five years down the road and making sure that you know you're not heading toward an iceberg or that you're prepared for, for remote um, work like, like we have to do today. Um, so there's, there's also 
you know, the inclusive mindset that you have to have and, and an open mindset, right? You have to be able to um, foster an environment that, that's open to new ideas, right? And you have to be honest about the expectations that, that those ideas need to bring as well, right? Um, so with great people though, um, you know, finding great people, is not, it's not always about solely skill set. I'm not always looking for uh, uh, electrical engineering or a computer science person or somebody that, you know, can write, uh, you know, 60, 70, 100 words per minute because um, I expect them to code that fast. It's, it's also about the mindset, right? Um, this day and age, I, I think everybody's aware that you can go out and, and do a whole lot of self-service education. You can go on YouTube and learn uh, anything that you want to learn, right? So at this point, I, I feel like the limitation is really based on imagination and, and on the um, sort of the force that's driving your passion, right? And, and that leads us into this mission statement, right? This mission statement, statement that, that's bonding, you know, the folks that you're, that you're recruiting in that are, that are being led by, not necessarily being managed by you, you want to lead. You want to lead people that, um, that you have a shared passion for. And so that mission statement hopefully is, is somewhat grounded by, you know, maybe personal experiences uh, that you've gone through and, and you want to progress a certain field forward if, if you, uh, you know, grew up, there's certain regions that didn't grow up with, with a clean water or, um, or an abundance of anything or something. Um, if that's driving you, there, there are plenty of people that will stand behind that kind of mission statement. And that's important, right? Because that's what's going to get a person out of bed in the morning when they've been working 10 hours or 12 hours a day. Uh, so I think creating that, that bond and that glue um, that, that creates this idea that's bigger than any single person is, is super important. Now, now, that being said, you also have to be realistic about the goals, right? You have to set realistic goals that people can actually meet, right? And you have to track the progress and milestones and, you know, critical paths on those milestones. Are, are you, is, uh, you know, Bob holding something up and um, in, in order for Jennifer to move forward? And, and how are you sort of removing obstacles and how are you building a roadmap, you know, to get those milestones? And, and is it dynamic enough to, to change course if necessary, if, if uh, something like COVID-19 hits? Are you able to pivot? Is it, is it sort of foolproof? Nothing is foolproof, but you want to mitigate the risk as best as possible. Thank you. Yeah, no. Um, so something that kind of jumped out at me of what you said was that the idea of like finding out if somebody just wants to be a sole contributor or if they mm -hmm. want to have a leadership role, right? I think, and, and then Greg, this also goes to uh, kind of your comment of finding the people that are, are good at certain things. I also think it's about energy, right? What, what sucks energy from you and what gives you energy, right? Uh, I've been on teams where going and interacting with clients, having to go out and talk to partners, having these kind of very I mean, you know, uh, managing relationships and building relationships that to some people that's draining to me. I like that. Right. I, I get energy from it. You know, COVID's definitely been hard not being able to see people and go out and interact with people. Right. Absolutely. So, um, so it's like one of those things about understanding where you are in terms of, um, do I just, am I cool with just being a, a specialist and doing, doing my thing and, and doing my that, or do I need to have some sort of leadership role for me to fulfill what I want to get done, right? Absolutely. And, and you know, that, that comes down to, you know, a foundational, what makes you happy, right? What makes you happy um, will likely make you successful, right? So, so I know I, I like new opportunities. I like healthy living. I like freedom. Um, I like a little bit of competition as well. And I know if I don't have those pieces, I may not be happy. Now, those could come in the form of a leadership role, or they could come in the form of, of an individual contributor or an IC role. Uh, but I, by that same token, I also have to identify what doesn't make me happy. What, what, is, what makes me unsuccessful, right? Uh, lacking direction, for example, or, or having other people's um, esteem influence mine. I may have great you know, self-esteem, but you know, when other folks look at me a certain way or, or judge my work, it may you know, force me to not, not uh, be as productive? Um, do I hold resentment? Uh, am I missing support? Uh, so the, I think identifying those fundamental drivers for folks is, is super important. I think it's just a building block um, of what, what a, what'll drive that person to want to do the next thing and, and keep them motivated throughout the long, you know, the marathon, so to speak. Yep. Yep. For sure. So uh, Antoine, I kind of, uh, on that kind of notion and going from a solopreneur to knowing that you need a team, what are the things that jump out? What are, what are the things that energize you? What are the things that you pulled out of your experiment of, of self-awareness that you know you're good at and, and the things that you're not good at? 
Well, I know that I'm good at sales <clears throat> and I'm bad at uh, the other 50% of things you need to be good at. Um, I'm not organized as I should be. I'm organized enough to run a solopreneur. I am not organized enough to run a team. Um, I'm not organized when it comes to the finances of it. And I don't mean bringing in money because I love the sales, but I'll try to get back out there and go sell. And if there's a vendor that did work for us, that vendor needs to get paid. And so building around me a team that's going to handle that, um, it, it's important to build a team that you trust. Okay. And it's important to start with people that may be close to you, may know, they may know you, they may be professionals, like they may be a CPA in their normal day life, but they may be willing to volunteer a couple hours with you. Now, this person isn't going to be a full-time hire for you, but there can still be a small, good part of your team. So your team could be full of full-time players if you can afford it. Your team could be one other full-time player and advisors. Your team could be part-time players. So your team could have different levels of participants as long as you're treating them fairly when it comes to um, um, just gratitude alone. Start there. Say thank you for everything and describe what you're saying thank you for. Um, stop and do that. Um, don't have a mindset that It'll all make sense when we get there. Do it now. Think now. Um, also, compensation. If you can compensate now, compensate now. If you can't compensate in money, compensate in, hey, man, I know I, this whole meeting's on me. I'm bringing food. I mean, different levels for different entrepreneurs, but you also have to know the partners you're with. Some partners are coming from professional background, and if, if you're not paying $150 an hour what they used to get paying, they're not going to be willing to work with you. It's nothing against them. They're just not the partner for you right now if you can't afford them. So always knowing yourself and your strengths and your capabilities and where you're going are going to be in play because sometimes you may start with a partner and their main goal is to just help you get off the ground. And then you guys may split and then you may start running the company more yourself. All those things are all possibilities. So look at uh, building a team as building help in a very basic form and then see who around you can help you that is... Uh, competent and reliable and start there. And then you can actually replace somebody that was helping you on the weekends because they're full-time CPA with the part-time CPA. And it may not be the same person, but you can be so thankful that person help you get off the ground. And that's how it work it very, very slow and practical. Thank you. And so, and, and again, thank you for being open and honest about strengths and weaknesses, right? You know, and trying to say, this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm not. Um, and so I, actually, we got a question from the audience. Uh, this is from Prudence. So um, she asked, can you comment on paid team members versus partnerships? How do you go get a team if you are truly alone, as Greg said, you know, when there's no money? So, so Greg, I'll let you kind of take that is like, what's your advice you have? You have a, a you know, uh, Antoine or me, you may, may even, uh, or I, you may see us eventually. And we come with you with an idea. We say, Hey, we we're we're trying to put this off the ground. You know, we can maybe get some customers. What do you say? How, how do you go about kind of advising on a paid team member versus a partnership? And when I hear partnership, I also hear like maybe a, you know, a bring on a co-founder or so forth. So. This, this can start to get very tricky because I spend a fair amount of time talking to more established companies in particular about strategic partnerships and what those should look like. But let's okay. skip that for the talk moment. On, talk on that. Talk on that too. Don't, you know, don't, don't hold okay. back. <laughs> Stepping back a little bit from that, let's say you're a startup or you've only been in business for a few years and you really realize, okay, I need to build out my team. I'm gonna, this is where I get to give a plug for the Small Business Development Center, <laughs> my employer. We don't charge anything for our services. And I've been on a lot of companies' advisory boards and on the, essentially a team member, um, again, for literally hundreds of companies. It's just, it's, it's part of what we do. We offer no cost advice. Now, let's say you're a company, I noticed there was another question that talked about Europe. Yep. Um, yeah, I did see that. Okay. If did you're... If, if you're doing if you're doing work internationally that deals with the Department of Commerce, they haven't they have a responsibility much as we do to help you with that, and they don't charge for their services either. There are all kinds of government agencies that are out there that are designed to help you that don't charge for their services. If you have a product that you want to sell to, I don't care if it's the federal government, state government, locally, there's an organization called the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, or yeah, that's usually what it's called, PTAC. It's sometimes PTAP. 
uh, procurement technical assistance program. All they do is government procurement. They know it inside and out. If you need to go through the registration process in order to become a government uh, contractor, they'll walk you through it and they don't charge. There's lots of free advice you can get out there. Take advantage of all of that free advice before you start worrying about paying anybody. Now, um, strategic partnerships are tricky. PTAC, as a matter of fact, does have a mentoring program where they will match up a small company with a larger company that's in the same industry. That can be very helpful. Um, you need to be very careful with that. I'll save that. I, I do want to comment on that a little bit later, but not, not for right now. We'll set aside a few concerns I have about that. But yeah, you should, be, you should definitely take advantage of all the free advice you can. There are folks who might be willing to work for equity. If they believe in you, if you're a good salesperson and you've got a great idea, there are people who will, um, there are competitions, in fact. There are pitch competitions where you can meet uh, prospective mentors. And some of them may be willing to say, you know, I like your idea. I know you don't have any money. I'm willing to help. I'm willing to be on your advisory board. I'm willing to be on your, on your corporate board in exchange for some amount of equity. And you know, I'll, I'll help you get to the point where you actually are a profitable company. So those are options. Now, obviously that's not an option for everyone, but it's something to be aware of. So, and I think I'll, I'll stop there and let the other guys jump in. You, Antoine, you wanna comment on that or? And can you um, alliterate the question a little, a little bit more, ask it again? Yeah, so so the difference between paid team members versus partnerships, and I would say and on your end, and I would, I'll, I can comment on this afterwards, but like co-founders, you know, looking for other people who are willing to kind of come on and work for equity and so forth. Um, did you, you know, did you ever get to the point where you were hiring people for uh, Triple Tote? And, you know, did you ever think about getting a co-founder? Yeah, for Triple Toe, I did not think about a co-founder. That was a different animal. It was like my first baby. I held it tight with the ups that it created, the downs that holding it so tight. It <laughs> and I still hold it tight, so I just accept that. That's just my baby. Um, but no, for real, um, depending on your closeness to what you're working on and your desire to, to um, scale it, the more you can loosen up to allow other people to help you, the faster it will scale. And you will experience the otherwise at a certain point, you'll see you'll see an access where it's working and then it'll abruptly slow down because you're not bringing on team members. Strategic partnerships are a very, very good way of not giving up your company or equity, or even if you don't have the experience yourself yet to work along somebody who can bring that value and now they're benefiting from just profit sharing. And so the best way to get a good strategic partner, if you can't afford um, to hire somebody, go get a sale and then say, hey, I got this opportunity with company XYZ. Will you partner with me? Because I can do this half of it, but I can't do that half of it. And that's an easy way to get the experience. It's an easy way to look on the other side and see what you may need to bring on board later because the strategic partner is coming with that experience in their belt and you both are benefiting financially. So if you can't hire anybody, a strategic partnership is a great thing, but you can't avoid the option of going to get that sale that's gonna fund the machine to make it all work. Mm -hmm, for sure. And and uh, actually it kind of uh, circles back to, to kind of what I was gonna say. So uh, five years ago in 2015, actually 2014, technically when I went into the Reset Accelerator, Impact Accelerator, uh, went in there with an idea for an aquaponics business uh, or business uh, around aquaponics. And guess what? Um, there was two other guys pitching an aquaponics business as well. Um, and so for, for me, you know, I knew right away I, um, that a team was needed. It, it wasn't going to be done by myself. I know my strengths. I know my weaknesses. And so um, it, we both actually were in that accelerator. Uh, they went uh, forward with the, um, the, their idea with it. I did another idea in the accelerator. But that day, um, you know, the first day we said, hey, let's go talk. Let's go talk because there's something here, you know, at the, uh, during that time, aquaponics was a very small industry. We knew a little bit about each other. Um, and we um, actually went and did, I would say three to four multi-hour long conversations, a couple of walk and talks, a couple of hikes to talk through where we were, uh, the three of us, uh, where we, where our visions were for aquaponics, 
um, how we wanted to get there and so forth. And we had some tough conversations, uh, you know, as, as a part of every team is to be able to have tough conversations before we even signed anything on a dotted line saying that we are going to partner up and, you know, um, uh, you know, make a, uh, make a business together. So that is something. And Antoine, you're, you're kind of right too, Zeb and, and Greg, you, you know, as an entrepreneur, sometimes you have to go sell the, your first employee or your first co-founder. You have to convince them that what you're doing is big enough. And, you know, convincing one person at a time builds a business, right? That, that, uh, that's how, that's how you do it. Um, so, uh, sometimes you, you gotta do that. Um, I will have to say, um, on the idea of like building a team, I think tough conversations are, um, you know, have the, first of all, if you can't have all the tough conversations before you even start a business, once there's money involved or even more difficult things come up, it's going to be harder to have the conversations that you need to have to progress. And I know that myself and my two co uh, co-founders, we, um, it maybe wasn't easy to have some of the conversations, but what I was telling an advisor uh, or a week ago um, is that it's getting easier every single time. And we're getting better at it every single time. And that's the point, right? We can have the conversation quicker. We can be more direct in it. We can get over, you know, kind of, okay, we're on the same page, let's move on, right? Um, and so that's something about uh, building a team that you wanna be able to do. Um, and when you're talking to somebody, finding somebody, that's something that you want to do. So actually Mark, I, I saw uh, Mark from Giverang. Uh, hey, uh, how you doing? Um, so uh, Mark, I would say Reset's a good uh, place to go. Um, SBDC, people like Greg, it's kind of interesting. Greg may not be a recruiter, but he may know some people that may introduce you. I think that you and uh, Mark, you and I actually got connected by, um, uh, by somebody else. So I think Connecticut's such a small state that um, being open and saying, hey, I'm looking for XYZ type of person and put that out into the ecosystem, I think you might kind of find, uh, find those people to, to come and be a part of it. Um, so I'm going to, okay, nice. I, I'm seeing them roll in. So this is, this is a good thing. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of pair a couple of kind of questions together. Um, and so, uh, Miguel, uh, do, is your team international or is it just U S based? Um, it's actually just U S based. So I, I, my team covers, um, everything West of the Mississippi. So I'm okay. scattered across the Western United States. Now my, okay. my artifact, my, um, responsibilities on artificial intelligence scale into, into a global role. Okay. But that's more of a, an escalation subject matter expert. So not necessarily okay. leading a team in that respect. All right, cool. So mm -hmm. I guess that one of the questions was, was you know, we have uh, um, somebody from Saudi Arabia and they're mm -hmm. looking to kind of build up the culture and, and so forth. Um, and like, how can you uh, find similar people who kind of understand the startup culture and so forth? For me, I think this comes down to customer discovery. It's, it's a little bit of, you got to go and talk to people, right? Absolutely. Do you understand the startups? Do you understand this? Are you interested in it? Um, but I'd love to hear your all kind of, uh, um, you know, answers on that is how to find other people that are similar, which may lead to a team or may lead to kind of uh, other, other active participants. I, I can, um, I could speak to just uh, spearheading, um, you know, AI sort of uh, communication internally on a global scale. Um, I, I spent most of most of last year doing that, and and I'd say you you hit it on the head. It, it's really about going out there and communicating the message, communicating with folks. You you may not you may not have a hundred percent interest where everyone everyone is ready, and and it might be something that's still ramping up. The idea may not be ready for the for the region that you're targeting, uh, but but through you know continuous sort of communication. And advocating for whatever it is that idea is, it it it'll continue to snowball, um, and essentially you'll you'll get you know year after year you'll get folks that are that are wanting to you know get on the train and get on that ride, um, and it also helps you as a as a leader that that's trying to right size that message and and tailor that message to your audience. Every every region has a different um, approach to messaging. You you may need to speak slower. You may you may need to. Um, use different language. Um, there, there are a whole different set of, of criteria for every region that I think if you're, if you're trying to garner attention toward any idea, you, you, you have to learn as you go. And you know, first, first step, you, you get out there and you baseline. You, you find out what worked and what didn't work and, and soli you solicit feedback. You, you wanna know what didn't, what didn't work. It's not easy. It's not easy to get those, uh, you know, those comments that say, hey, you, you did a, you did a terrible job, but uh, these are the these are the areas you did well, uh, but but they help you grow. So you you know you need to grow. I I think we all know you have to have a little bit of tough skin, right, to uh, 
uh, to pursue any type of um, idea and, and uh, get other folks interested in that idea. Uh, but you grow from that feedback. You know, you, you, you tailor it, you, you realize, okay, next, I wanna go back next year. I've, uh, I've improved in these areas where I've got very specific feedback. And, and then you redeploy the message, but still grounding you know, that mission statement, the piece that's driving you to, to go after this idea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, cultural context, I think is huge. Um, you know, if you're if you're from a community, you know, that community, you know how to interact with that community. Um, and, I, and I mentioned Saudi Arabia, it's Abu Dhabi. So I apologize there. Um, but one of the things is that I, as a local person, so I'm clearly not from the Middle East. Um, and I would I would defer to somebody there to say, how does this stuff resonate with mm -hmm. your, your friends? How does it resonate with your family? I will have to say is that, and I think uh, Antoine, you maybe would, uh, would agree with this, is that um, probably after a few years of us kind of going on our entrepreneurial career, our family finally was just like, all right, enough with the ideas, enough trying to do customer discovery on me, enough trying to pitch me an idea. But the thing was, is that that was a part of his like family and friends. That's where you're just talking about going on. And, 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 you know, those family and friends have introduced me to other people who are connected in that space. And then guess what? We have a, we have a, a bond around it. So it's one of those things where start with people around you get, you know, six degrees of separation is a real yeah. thing in Connecticut. It's, it's less than that. Uh, it's definitely three or four, I would say in Connecticut that you can get to almost everybody. Um, mm. So it's one of those things where definitely um, just start reaching out and, and you know just talking to people. Um, yeah, I would a just one. become a spokesman for your business and its mission. Just everywhere you go, introduce yourself as the person you are, the, the company or the startup you represent. Just really introduce yourself as it. And you'll be surprised, even serendipitous, who we brought into your path. There's people around us all the time that can help us but we don't talk to everybody, so we don't know who they are. But when you get in the habit of just starting friendly conversation with no, no, no agenda, but you're just introducing yourself and let the person fill in what they may know about it. They may be, you guys may have a great conversation first. That's just a regular interaction and find out you have a business, um, something in common in business afterwards. But you really got to meet people all the time, every day, and you got to adapt to the different types of people out there not be intimidated by it and not be scared to voice what you do and not exaggerate or lie about what you do also. Just mm -hmm. really just be honest and open and people can sense you have a good heart. The help will come pouring in, I promise you. Can I, I wanna yeah. sort of reiterate what Antoine just said because that's really important, especially if you're dealing with in a multicultural environment. If you're working with companies in the Middle East or Europe, you know, Europe is not a monolithic place by any stretch of the imagination. The way you're going to interact with folks there is going to be different. Uh, it's probably going to be different in Abu Dhabi versus um, uh, the Saudi Arabia versus anywhere else in the Middle East as well. So networking really is critically important. You know someone who knows someone who knows someone. You can have just, and you don't need to, you arrange for that conversation with someone you, you think you need to speak to about your idea. But you don't go in trying to sell them something. You go in and you listen. You say, look, this is what I'd like to do. What are your thoughts? And just listen. You'll learn an incredible amount by doing that. And don't be shy. You cannot be shy if you're going to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> No, no. And, you, and you also got to get thick skin for people saying, I don't know about that idea. And, you yeah. know, it's yeah. a, if, you, if you get enough of those people saying you don't get it, but then you have one person that's like, oh, I see it. You never, I mean, it's okay to get no's, right? Um, yeah. But, and sometimes, um, it, sometimes it's timing as well. Sometimes you have a, a five minute window before your audience just your, their eyes glaze over and they're like, I, I don't even know where you're going now. So, I mean, tailoring that message is important as well because you may, you may only have five minutes. Might yep, be an yep. elevator ride. <laughs> and uh, so I'm glad that I'm glad that we're still getting questions in our audience and glaze over. All right. So that's good. <laughs> um, so I have another one uh, that's coming in and, and uh, Greg and, and Miguel, you probably may have a little bit more experience with this. So if you're disappointed with the new hire's performance in the first few weeks, right, how do you determine whether they, they need more leadership on your end? Is it, is it the leader's fault, right? Is, is a leader not providing a good onboarding experience? Um, do they need time to settle in or are there, is, is it just not going to work out? Like, how do you know? Yeah, I'm going to jump in right off, right off the bat. Uh, oftentimes, especially with newer companies, you brought in someone and you probably did not give them a position description. You didn't really make it clear what it is they need to do. So until that's established, you, sh you can't really judge the quality of what they're doing. If you didn't really make it clear what you expect of them, it's not their fault. So start with that. And then assuming you 
you have made it clear and you have specific performance criteria, if they're not meeting them, sit down with the person and say, look, this is what we expect. This is what we have in writing. This is what we expected. This is what you're not doing. Let's, let's come up with a plan for correcting that. And then if it still isn't working, now you have the basis to say, you know what, this isn't working for you. This isn't working for us. Let's agree to mutually part ways. But you can't, but just sort of saying, bring someone in and saying three weeks later, this isn't working. I mean, what, what, what's, what led up to that? And make sure you, you took the necessary steps before you make a decision. Very good. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I, I, um, I can't say that I could speak to any, uh, any personal experience on that front at, at this point, but I think it, it does definitely come down to um, being upfront about what the responsibilities, what the expectations or the role are and continuing to manage those expectations along the way, making sure you're in sync. I think staying connected with your team. Um, I, I, I like to tell my team that, hey, look, you, you've, got, you've got the job already. I trust you already. Um, you're, you don't have to continue to uh, prove that you're here. You've already proven that you're here. You've, you've already given me, uh, you know, that you've already reached the milestones that I had, you know, set out for you. Now let's just continue to sort of track and, and tailor it you know, based on whatever your success factors continue to be, because those change, right? People are dynamic. You have to deal with human factors every day. Um, they're, they're, we're not dealing with machines that you can, you, you can program a, a response. So, you know, the day-to-day, -day, I mean, you have to understand that there are also personal things that may be happening with people. You may, you may feel like your, 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 your company or your business objectives aren't being met because this person isn't following through on something, but rather than saying, Hey, look, you're not, you, you've got to go. You're not meeting these, you know, these numbers. You, you need to, I think, take a step in, you know, double click into what's going on in that person's life, right? They could be going through something, especially if they're, if it's contradictory to, to what you, how you hired them, right? When you hired them, you saw something in them. You, you, and if you're, if you're like me, you go through a lot of, an endless amount of interviews to find the right person because you're trying to facilitate and nurture a certain culture and, um, a growth mindset that I spoke about earlier, um, you know, the mindset versus skill set piece. So, I mean, that doesn't just change overnight, not without other factors being involved. And so I think you need to get to the bottom of what those factors are. You're not, you're not just kind of throwing it out and saying, hey, look, you didn't meet this one thing, you're gone. I think you need to find out and see what you can do about it, especially as a leader. I mean, it's, it's some, I, I look at it as a personal objective to me to know what, you know, what those success factors continue to be. And if they're personal and I can help with that, I want to help with that as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. As an entrepreneur, as a CEO, like you work for your employees sometimes, right? You, you have to work for them. And, I, and, and, and I, Greg, I like you kind of pointing out is that as a small business, sometimes you're not given the most uh, like specific job description. <laughs> you're not saying these are exactly your metrics. These are exactly what you have to do. And, and that again is something where some people can handle that. Some people can't, right? Um, I, I, I've heard it many a times uh, uh, and you kind of mentioned to it uh, or alluded to it, Miguel, is that, uh, you know, hire slow, fire quick, right? Fire fast kind of a thing. Um, right. And I think that, I think there's a, a couple of uh, pieces of that. I think it's where if you can feel like an intuition that it's not a culture fit, they, you know, some people can get through an interview process and maybe not make it through, you know, kind of onto the other side or you see some stuff. Sometimes you just have to make that move, but you also, as all of us, we've all failed at something. We've all had to get better at something. We've all not, I mean, if we're all hitting our goals, like in OKRs, maybe your goals aren't uh, big enough, right? If you're always getting hundreds, you're not really stretching yourself, right? So so that's another thing. Um, I, I, from my experience, another thing is that in a startup business, sometimes you go after certain business uh, or certain types of um, uh, revenue, certain product lines, and you may bring on a team for that product line. And then you find out that you truly don't have product market fit. And then you, you say, okay, well, I don't want to fire these people. And you try to switch them into another role. You try to switch them around to make it fit into another product. And sometimes that just doesn't work out. And so it's like, you know, I've, I've, as a, as a, you know, I've only been able to manage about a team of t uh, 10, uh, 10 or 11. And at that point, you know, you feel very, you know, you want to keep that person on, but sometimes you just don't fit with the skill set you need moving forward. And again, from, from a small business, sometimes it's a little bit harder to uh, move them around than in a big business like, you know, Dell or something. 
So we are coming up on time and I, guys, I really appreciate all the um, insight you've given and, and uh, you know, being open and transparent. So I just will do a little bit of round robin. Um, we got, uh, we got about five minutes. Um, so any last kind of words on uh, what you, um, you know, on building a team, uh, creating culture uh, and so forth that you want to leave with the audience? Um, I, I would say again, the, the most important thing is to get exact to where you are yourself culturally, because um, once you start a business, you can give yourself the CEO title, but you don't have any CEO experience. So give yourself time to develop and most times try to point the finger at yourself first, just so you can make sure that you know where you are before bringing on team members. Because a lot of times we feel CEO is more of a character role. I'm the boss. No, you're responsible for everything. You're actually the least paid employee of everybody, <laughs> you know? And so if you still feel like I'm the boss and stuff isn't going well, you probably have that upside down. You really got to just do a lot of self-inventory. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that one. Miguel? Yeah, no, I mean, I, absolutely. I think, you know, don't give up, obviously. I mean, uh, you know, once you find that uh, that passion that's driving you, you know, continue to pursue it. Obviously, uh, be dynamic enough to um, augment or pivot as needed. Um, I, I'd say lear learn from some of the greats. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that have been successful, right? That you know we could probably rattle off a list of them. So uh, you don't need to make all the mistakes yourself, right? You you can learn from other people's mistakes as well. So um, I think it's it's a good idea to to you know do do a lot of research up front, you know, before you you know measure that whole measure, you know, ten times before you cut. Um, I, I think that that's super important. It it's easy to I think to get carried away with with wanting to drive something before you know where you're going, right? Uh, the old adage of, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you don't know where you're going, any direction is correct, right? So uh, let's first find out what that direction is and, and drive super hard toward that direction and don't let anything get in your way. Greg? Um, in general, depending on the kind of business you have, be aware of the fact that if you, look, if you are in a business that you need investors, what investors typically are buying is your team and not your product. It's a lot of entrepreneurs don't understand that. That's one of the main reasons why you have to have a strong team. And lastly, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say something about intellectual property. If you if you started a business around a new, an invention or a, a revolutionary new idea, there's something called a non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> Learn as much as you can about those and have people sign them. You have to be very careful. And I've heard of large companies that were willing to supposedly come in as a strategic partner that essentially steal your idea. You've got to be, that's a reality. So that's why you get advisors, get the kind of people around you who can tell you to be careful in, in certain kinds of situations. Again, don't be shy about getting advice. Yep, and uh, that's I think for for everybody in the entrepreneurial and innovative innovating space, advice. You know, be open to other uh, points of view, other critical thought uh, around your your idea and so forth. Um, so, um, guys, thank you very much again. This was a this was a great panel. A lot of different takes on uh, you know building a uh, a team and uh, what uh, what we have to do to motivate them and so forth. So uh, again, a couple of questions in there that kind of hit on like where in Connecticut do you should you go? So I would say offer a few things. One, SBDC. Again, like Greg would say, there's there's uh, start with them. And in the in the terms of just talk to them about your business, they may be able to connect some dots. You have Launch Hartford, right? You have Upward Hartford. You have Reset. So these organizations, they're they're in this community to help connect the dots between entrepreneurs. So just reach out to them. You have District in New Haven. Okay, reach out reach out to them. Um, I also another thing, U UConn, CCSU. You know, uh, Yale, Sacred Heart. These are these are universities that are trying to do uh, and try to nurture the the ecosystem here. So just reach out. Again, people in Connecticut, people in this space want to connect the dots. Um, so I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna offer up everybody else in the in the ecosystem your your uh, um, uh, your your inbox or so forth to to make a connection to somebody looking for a co-founder here in Connecticut. Um, I know I found my co-founders through Reset. So, um, you know, again, I, that, that's where I did mine. Um, so, all right, cool. Well, thank you everybody for uh, joining us and until uh, next time.